taken from the Ultimate Killer Collection, by Stuart Dandel. John Reginald Christie. Tindrillington Place. Forty-year-old John Reginald Christie was a quiet little man, with a receding reddish ginger hairline and pale blue eyes. His wife, Ethel, was a slightly overweight woman whom friends believed to be frightened of her husband. As a couple their peers thought of them as ungainly and aloof, with many disliking the way the pair seemed to think they were better than their neighbors. For these reasons, John and Ethel Christie kept pretty much to themselves. John Christie was originally a Yorkshireman and had endured a strict upbringing, in which, his father was not afraid to beat his children. He would make them go for long walks, which were more like military marches than strolls in the countryside. John was a frail child and was disliked by his father due to this, though his mother spoiled him. It is also believed that she emasculated him, which was reinforced by the fact by his four sisters. He was a very private child with few friends and while still quite young, he developed a pathological abhorrence of dirt. As Christie got older, he began to take part in activities at his local church, joining the choir and eventually becoming a scoutmaster. The part he enjoyed most about the role, was wearing the uniform, it appeared to reinforce his own grandiosity and helped him feel empowered. His relationship with his sisters over time, became complex. As a young child Christie was incredibly delicate, he had once been disturbed to see one of his sister's legs up to the knee, which in a modern context appears laughable, but times were most certainly different then. He also became attracted to the women around him, even though they bossed him about, hating them at the same time for their dominance over him. This type of conflict often causes unwanted behavior if not rectified. It is likely that at this time he began to develop an antipathy towards all women, mainly because he felt he could not satisfy them. The nicknames given to him at school when his first attempts at lovemaking ended in failure, did not help, his peers teased him with the names, Reggie No Dick, and Can't Make It Christy. He was a signalman during the First World War and at one point lost his voice for three years, following a hysterical reaction to an incident when a mustard gas shell knocked him unconscious. This however, did not stop him marrying Ethel in 1920. The marriage wouldn't be a completely satisfying one however, he was blighted by impotence and even so, still visited prostitutes as he had been doing since the age of 19 though the reasoning for that is unsure, as the visits only ever increased his feelings of inadequacy. Christie's first brush with the law occurred after he became a postman in 1920. Habitually criminal, he stole some postal orders and ended up being sentenced to prison for three months. Not learning his lesson, he was back in trouble again in 1924, when he was 25. This time he was put on probation at the post office for charges of violence, and there were also whispers that he had been using the local prostitutes. In an effort to avoid his problems, Christie walked out on Ethel and traveled to London. In 1928, Christie was back in prison again, this time sentenced to nine months for theft. When he was released he lived with a prostitute, but when he hit her on the head with a cricket bat, he was returned to jail for six months. A few years later and Christie was arrested yet again and sent back to prison, this time for the theft of a car. There were also police reports regarding his violence towards women by now, however these could not be proven at the time. In 1933, Christie asked Ethel to move back in with him and for some reason she agreed, traveling down to join him in London. Little did Ethel know however, the kind of man John Reginald Christie had become in the ten years they had been apart. Christie had been a hypochondriac since he was a child and this would not ease in his adulthood. Following an accident in which he was hit by a car, he began an incredible series of visits to the doctor, totaling 173 appointments, in just 15 years. This myriad of ailments also gave him an excuse to remain at home and complain about his predicament. 
the couple moved into the ground floor flat at 10 Rillington Place, in December of 1938. Number 10 Rillington Place was a small Victorian house, built in the 1860s when the Notting Hill and North Kensington areas were undergoing development. It was situated where the elevated dual carriageway, the West Way, runs today, located in a row of three-story terraced houses. The house was split into three flats, none of which had a bathroom. Instead, an outhouse in the garden was used by the occupants of all three flats, and a washhouse was also located there for the use of tenants, but it was not always functioning. Apparently the couple were pleased with the flat, because as it was on the ground floor, they would enjoy exclusive use of the garden. Christie meanwhile, had signed up as a volunteer member of the War Reserve Police and he was delighted to pick up his uniform at Harrow Police Station and served for four years. Incredibly, they asked no questions about his criminal record. Unfortunately for neighbors of Christie however, he became a little too fanatical about the role and was soon known in this community as, the Handler of Rillington Place. All the while, without a thought for Ethel, Christie was continuing to consort with other women, one of whom worked with him at the police station. When her husband returned from fighting overseas, he gave Christie a severe beating. In April of 1948, Timothy Evans and his pregnant wife Beryl, moved into the top floor flat at 10 Rillington Place, just six months later and Beryl gave birth to a daughter, Geraldine. Timothy Evans was an diminutive, uneducated, Welsh lorry driver of limited intelligence, who was fond of lying and talking grandiose fantasies. He was also a heavy drinker with a very bad temper and he and his wife often engaged in loud and sometimes violent arguments, mostly over Beryl's inability to make ends meet. Evans' low wages barely covered the rent and their bills. Another storm was coming in late 1949 when Beryl informed her husband that she was pregnant again. Beryl insisted immediately that she wanted an abortion, but Timothy Evans was a Roman Catholic and so was against the idea. Beryl ignored her husband, took pills, and did whatever she could in an attempt to abort the baby. Eventually she confided in John Christie and although he had absolutely no previous experience, he told Beryl Evans that he knew how to carry out abortions stating that he had learned how to do it during the war. In what can only be envisioned as a moment of sheer desperation or madness, Christie somehow persuaded her to let him undertake the procedure. It would end in catastrophe. When Timothy Evans came home later that day on the 8th of November, 1949, he was horrified to learn from Christie that Beryl had died during the operation. What had actually happened was that Christie had gone up to their flat after Evans had gone to work. Beryl laid a quilt on the floor in front of the fire and lay down on it. Christie may then have tried to gas Beryl and she had panicked and begun to lash out at him. He took out a cord and strangled her. He then tried to have intercourse with her dead body. John Christie then told Evans that he would dispose of her body down a nearby drain and that he would also find someone to look after Geraldine, ordering Evans to leave London. Christie later told the police that he saw Beryl leave with her baby around noon and never saw her again. Later, Timothy Evans came home and the Christies went out for the evening. Around midnight he claimed, he and Ethel heard a loud thump from above them. As the man in the second floor flat was away, it could only have come from the Evans flat on the third floor and it was followed by the sound of something heavy being dragged across the floor. It all became a little too much for Evans and he eventually went to a police station a few weeks later, to tell them that he had disposed of his wife's body after she had taken something to make her abort her baby. He was afraid to bring Christie's name into it and said that he had obtained the substance he had given her from a stranger. Their police soon found issues with Evan's story. Firstly, they did not find the body down the drain outside the front door where Evans said he had put it. Secondly, they could not see how one man, especially a small man like Evans, 
could have moved the extremely heavy manhole cover that took three of them to shift. Officers confronted Timothy Evans about these inconsistencies and he confessed that it had been Christie who had administered the abortion pills, and it was also he that put Beryl in the drain. Police then further searched the house at 10 Rillington Place, but it was no more than a half-hearted look around and they even failed to notice the human thigh bone that was being used to prop up the garden fence. They did find a stolen briefcase however, which supplied them with enough evidence to arrest Heavens. Police decided to question Christie still, and it was at this point that he emphasized how much of a liar Timothy Evans was and how violent his marriage to Beryl had been. Making sure to twist the knife on the poor man whose wife he had murdered. There was still no sign of Beryl however, and so yet again a search of the property was carried out, this time more thoroughly. Eventually they found her out the back, in the wash house, Beryl's body and that of her daughter, Geraldine. It was estimated they had been dead for three weeks. During lengthy police interrogations, Evans inexplicably confessed no fewer than four times to murdering his wife. At Evans' trial six weeks later, Christie denied that he had agreed to perform an abortion on Beryl in his testimony, plus Evans' poor performance in the witness box, resulted in a guilty verdict. Timothy Evans was sentenced to death. He was then hanged from his neck until his death at Pentonville Prison on the 9th of March, 1950. John Reginald Christie, had gotten away with murder. In late 1952, long-suffering wife Ethel Christie, suddenly disappeared. John Christie told their friends that she had moved back to Sheffield and that he was going to join her when he had settled their affairs in London. He then gave up his job, sold all their furniture and rented out his flat to a couple. After they had stayed there just one night however, they learned that the flat was not John Christie's to rent and were thrown out. The landlord then rented the flat to a Jamaican national by the name of Beresford Brown. One day while tidying up the kitchen, Brown peeled off some wallpaper and discovered a door leading to a pantry. Opening the door slightly, he shone a torch to the space beyond. There to his horror, he saw the body of a woman seated and hunched forward, clad only in bra, stockings, and suspenders. He immediately called the police and when they arrived, they discovered another two women's bodies in the concealed area. After some investigation, police soon realized they were the bodies of three prostitutes that John Christie had lured back to the house and killed while he lived there. Kathleen Maloney, Rita Nelson, and Hector Rhina McLennan had fallen victim to his wiles. Searching the remainder of the flat, officers found the remains of Ethel Christie under the floorboards of the living room. John Christie had strangled her on the 14th of December, 1952. She had been in poor health and the killer claimed later that he had merely put her out of her misery. In the garden of Tin Ruling on Place, another two women's bodies were discovered. One was Austrian prostitute, Ruth Fuerst, and the other was a workmate of Christie's, whose guitar he had promised he could cure with a special type of inhaler. Bringing her to the flat, he had made her breathe in a concoction he had put in the drawer which he had connected to the gas supply. As she unwittingly breathed in the gas and weakened, Christie strangled her. Then while she lay dying, the clearly depraved Christie had intercourse with her. Christie's impotence, it seemed, only dissipated when he was murdering the woman with whom he was having sex. Of his first victim Bear Levins, Christie later said. I remember as I gazed down at the still form of my first victim, experiencing a strange, peaceful thrill. It was a thrill he would experience six times in total. After wandering around London for several weeks, as the entire Metropolitan Police Force searched for him, John Christie was finally arrested on Putney Bridge and confessed to the murders. He additionally admitted that he had killed Bear Levins, but he never confessed to killing her baby, Geraldine. Nonetheless, many thought it highly unlikely that two stranglers could live in the same house. 
On the 15th of July, 1953, John Reginald Christie was hanged on the same gallows as Timothy Evans. Debate about the execution of Evans raged on for years until in 1966, the Bourbon Report concluded that Christie had killed Geraldine Evans and persuaded Timothy Evans not to go to the police. Home Secretary, Roy Jenkins, awarded Timothy Evans a posthumous pardon in the case of Geraldine Evans. The outcry over the wrongful hanging of Timothy Evans, was a contributing factor to the abolition of the death penalty in the UK.